welcome to Good Grief, the podcast dedicated to demystifying, destigmatizing grief with compassion and humor. I'm Nikki, I'm an end of life doula and a grief coach in Columbus, Ohio. And today I have another amazing guest episode that I am so, so excited to share with you guys. I sat down and had a hilarious conversation with my new dear friend, Steve Case. Steve is an author and a 30-year veteran of youth ministry, speaker, workshop leader, and as he says in his bio, Steve Case is the snort laugh you'll hear at the back of church during your prayer on Sunday morning. (laughs) I met Steve through a mutual friend, and he just has the most amazing sense of humor, and I'm going to go ahead and put this out here right now, starting this moment. I'm putting a trigger warning. There is some strong language in this episode. Um, in fact, the title of his book that he wrote is called Fuck Death. And we reference the book. There are a handful of F-bombs. So I'm going to put the explicit lyric or, you know, the explicit content tag on this episode, put trigger warnings. This is not one to have the kiddos around. There's a lot of cuss cuss words on here that will be unbeeped. So fair warning. (laughs) That's all. But I was so excited to sit down and chat with him. He has such a great sense of humor. He's written several really great books, and I can't wait to read all of them. I will put links to everything in the description. I am just so excited for you guys to hear this conversation. But before we do that... As always, I have to do my due diligence here and remind you to please come and support me on Patreon if you would like to. I'm not going to force you to do it. That would be rude. But if you head over to patreon.com slash Nikki the Death Doula and support me there, you will be helping me to provide pro bono work to those who cannot afford my services. For as little as a dollar a month, you'll get grief affirmations once a week. The higher tiers, you get early access to this podcast. Everybody can get access to my Q and A's and some of my bonus content. So yeah, just hop on over there. I would appreciate that. But enough of that. I want to stop talking so we can get on to this week's episode, my conversation with Steve Case. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in this week. I have another great guest episode, somebody I am so excited to introduce you to, uh, my new dear friend, Steve Case. Steve, I'm going to let you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your writing. Uh, let's see. My name is Steve Case. Uh, I have been a freelance writer for 35 plus years, uh, about as long as I was also working as a youth pastor for various denominations, uh, because being a youth pastor does not pay bills. <laughs> so I started doing writing on the side. I've written uh, lots of books, most of it curriculum, some of it books of of deep introspection and the an- analyzing the the writings of a 17th century monk and then i can follow that up with a book of fart jokes so <laughs> it, it seems to be you know i i can crank it out i, I just need to i gotta ha- have to balance most of the time and uh uh this one book that we're talking about today I can use profanity, right? Oh, yes. I will put a disclaimer at the beginning of this in the intro. So, yes, swear all you want in this episode. Have at it. Oh, excellent. Okay. (laughs) The book is called Fuck Death. And it is a book about grief. And for those who don't grieve, like uh, the Hallmark cards say you're supposed to. So I, I wrote the book for that particular audience. And it seems to be doing really well. Awesome. Yeah. And I read, I got a copy and I read it. And it is phenomenal. And... Steve's comment on fart jokes probably makes all of you listeners know now why we are really good friends. <laughs> Kindred spirits with our 12-year-old boy sense of humor. Oh, yes. <laughs> so so um, what was your inspiration to write Fuck Death? Uh, several years ago, I had three students, two brothers and a sister, who lost both parents in two years. Oh. Their, their father to cancer. And then their mother, a year later, to alcoholism. Oh, jeez. And and suicide. And uh, uh, during that time at the church where I was working, my office became the safe place, you know, where everyone's trying to be really nice to you and say all the polite, nice things. And, you know, you're not allowed to say fuck you to someone who just told you, God, God has a plan, you know. 
you need to- That's so, my initial reaction. Fuck yeah, you. So my my office became the place where you could say fuck you. You could punch the couch. You could throw things against the wall. You could shake your fist at the ceiling and swear at God. Whatever you needed to do, you could be there and get that. Yeah. And it was very effective and very helpful just to have that place of outlet, that safe space to to say what you want and feel what you want to feel. And after after that, I decided I needed to write a book that was the safe place. Yeah. That, you know, you know, with this book, you can write what you want to write and you can throw it against the wall or you can rip the pages out and tear them into little pieces or whatever you need to do. Yeah. The book is the safe place where you can get that. That was that was the purpose of writing the book. That's awesome. And that's I love that. I had a I had a similar thought. I wrote a workbook called um, Grief Sucks. And I had a similar thought with that. And I even have one page in there where I talk about anger and how anger is OK. You're allowed to be of course you're angry. You know, you have suffered a horrendous loss. Something was in your life and now it's not. And you're angry about it. And I encourage people to like scratch on the page and then tear it out and rip it into shreds. So it's, it's okay. It's, it's just, you know, how you express it and, you know, try not to hurt other people. <laughs> That's obviously not the right way to express your anger, but anger is but a valid happens. response. But um, grief will make you into an asshole. Mm-hmm. And, and it did me when I lost my mom. Uh, and luckily, most of the people that you are an asshole to recognize that what you're going through and know you're, you're grieving and they love you and they will put up with your being an asshole for mm-hmm. however long it takes you to get through this this time. And then you're fine, you know. Yeah. But yeah, grief will do horrible things to you, make you into a different person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I always encourage my clients that I work with as a, as a, uh, either a death doula or grief coach to go ahead and express that anger. If you need to constructively, you know, my favorite thing is to tell people to go outside and howl at the moon or scream at the sky and swear. Yeah. If you want to yell a curse word in the air, it's fine. Let it out. Cause if you keep all that in, it's just going to fester and you grief will turn you into an asshole. But if you don't express that in some manner, you're going to continue to be an asshole. <laughs> It's like pushing a, a beach ball under the water in the pool. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Anybody can do that, but try doing it with six, you know, something's going to come up and smack you in the face eventually. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's just it. It, it smacks you. It does you hold a beach ball. It will come up and smack you in the face <laughs> and that hurts. And then you'll just be a bigger asshole because you're angry at that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a self-perpetuating cycle over and over. Perpetuating an asshole. There's, I think that, there's a sounds like a band I played in in the 80s, you know, <laughs> self-perpetuating asshole. I like it. That's, that's a good band name. So um, you said that you, you know, went through a lot when you lost your mother and you felt a lot of anger, too. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, um, when I was uh, this was about seven years ago, um, my my mother had cancer and I would. I was in the hospice with her. I was holding one hand. My father was holding her other hand and she just sort of quietly slipped out, you know, into whatever comes next. And then uh, I remember spending the next several days. I I know I wasn't, I knew I wasn't grieving. Mm-hmm. I knew I was holding it down because mm-hmm. I was trying to help my father how do you pick out a coffin for your, your spouse of 50 years? Yeah. That kind of stuff. So I was trying to help him, got him through the whole process. We got through the, the memorial. We got through the, the funeral. We got through all of the family in and out. And then I went back home, which was Florida at the time. And I remember uh, going to Starbucks on my way to work that first time, first day back to work. And the, girl behind the counter got my order wrong Uh oh! and i i was i was an asshole i was oh. a complete jerk to this girl so much so that i went back and apologized a few days later oh. back and i said look i i was in here two days ago and and i was going through a lot and i apologize i was a complete jerk to you i'm sorry and she said don't worry it happens all the time mm-hmm. but uh 
I I just unloaded on this girl and I was yeah. not her fault. And yeah. I went from I I got my coffee, I was still steaming, and I got to my my job at the church, and the children's Sunday school had made homemade sympathy cards and taped them to my office door. And right there, center of my door was this beautiful hand-drawn little girl's butterfly. And it said, I'm sorry your mommy died. Oh, God. And, and that was it. That was the moment where all of a sudden I just lost it. I, I just stood there in the hallway and sobbed because oh. that was the moment that it all went click. And then yeah. emotional toilet flush, if you will. <laughs> Boom! You know, and it was like I didn't think I could walk, but it uh, was that pushing it down thing. Mm. And suddenly, boom, up it comes. Yeah, and, and I see it. I see it all the time when I talk to people who are, you know, I'm doing funerals, and you can see the people who have that robot face on. Mm -hmm. It's like Nova King, you know. Yeah. Somehow, something releases in your brain that tells you mm -hmm. you're not going to feel this. We're going to get you through a few days and yeah. then you. Yeah. And that happens a lot. Yeah. I, and I had, I've shared that openly on this podcast many times. I had a very similar experience. My, when my brother died in 2015, I felt an obligation to take care of my parents mm -hmm. because they lost their oldest child and he had two young children they were both under 18 at that time and they were now without their father. And I just felt like I need to keep my shit together because I have to be here for my parents. I have to be here for his kids, his ex-wife and his friends. And I just felt like I don't I'm just the sister. I don't there's no grief with this. And I right how <laughs> looking back now, that's the dumbest thing I ever thought in my life. I was like, I don't need to grieve because I'm just the sister. And it I I didn't even think about grieving for so long. And then I started realizing I was holding it in. And then it was a good like three or four years later. And I had straight up a mental health crisis. Mm. It just, it exploded. And I, I felt awful all the time. And yeah, it took me a while to learn. And now, now, which is why I do what I do. I learned so much about grief and how to express it <laughs> and you have to face it. And I didn't at that time. And I've seen it. I, you were talking about with with your niece and nephew. I've seen it when I've worked with kids, with teenagers specifically. Mm -hmm. Teenagers are desperately wanting to be seen as adults. Yes. And they're looking at the adults and the adults are thinking, I need to be strong for the children. Mm -hmm. So they're being strong. The teenagers are modeling that behavior and saying, I'm strong. I'm not feeling this. Mm -hmm. And then the adults are going, why aren't the children crying? Why aren't they grieving? And it becomes this cycle that yeah. goes you have to give people permission to feel what they feel at that moment, whether it's anger or sadness or depression, whatever those things are. Yeah. Feel that you're allowed to feel what you feel. Don't let yeah. anyone tell you how you're supposed to grieve. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that too. And I, I know a lot of people I've, I've heard from other people who've experienced losses. They have a, a younger adult in their life, maybe a teenager or, tween um that they're just saying they're not, they don't seem to be expressing their grief and i'm like well have you let them have you told them it's okay to because sometimes we need to be given permission to grieve we we all know like we when we lose somebody or have a loss of any type that there's going to be grief and i would hope we know there will be some type of grief but we still don't give ourselves that permission and we need to give it to others too yeah feel what you feel go ahead and then yeah. deal with it as it comes out yeah, that's I feel like that's the best gift you can give somebody is the gift like you gave to those young kids. Like, let me be your safe space. Express it to me. Yeah. If you are afraid to express it in public, just express it to me. Let me let me hear it. Just let it all out. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then and then honoring that too. This is yeah. you know, what you feel is what you feel. And then let's move on from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and you have a kind of a unique position in that you've been a youth pastor for so long. So you've had a lot of exposure to kids and their losses and grief. Has there, has there been any, anything in particular over the years that has stuck out to you the most about how kids and teenagers are grieving? I, I think a lot of it is when 
kids, there, there's a certain amount of, of trying to explain death to, to children mm -hmm. and they need the something that's literal where you can say something like, you know, grandma is in God's kitchen you know, or something like that, where it gives them something to say, okay, you know, everybody's sad and grieving. Grandma is in God's kitchen because, you know, maybe, you know, but there, there comes a line where mm -hmm. you can't say that to an 18 year old, like, oh, right. grandmother's in God's kitchen. And the 18 year old in the head is going, fuck you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate right. your sentiments, you know, but uh, the, finding the line, even with sometimes with teenagers, if you use just that story I just told you of saying people are going to come up and tell you something like that, mm -hmm. you know, or asking them, what do you think has happened to grandma? You know, mm -hmm. or where do you think grandma is now? Or that kind of thing. Even if they're just writing it down, here's a blank piece of paper. Here's a ton of markers. Yeah. What's next? Just I don't care what you draw. Give me something. Mm -hmm. That if I was going to hang it on the wall and say, this is what's next, there it is, you know, and yeah. let them go and see what happens. Oh, I love that. Um, and that reminds me briefly, I had our mutual friend on my show a while ago, Nicole, uh, who talked uh, a lot about her experiences too, working with people in a, in a pastor capacity with grief and loss. And my sticking point, and you brought this up earlier, is when People feel the need, and I know we never know what to say. We put our foots in our mouths, but people feel the need to say things like it was all in God's plan or there's another angel in heaven now. Oh. And just how, <laughs> and it's, I get it. It's coming from a good place. And a lot of times we just don't know what to say. So we spit out a platitude, but what a horrible thing to say to somebody. Yeah. It's like somebody cuts off your right arm and someone says, God needed that arm in heaven. Right. That was my fucking arm. Are you kidding me? Thank you. Thank you. Or um, at least you have another arm. Yes. Oh, uh, in in the book, you read the book. I have yes. the, the list of horrible things that people say. Yes. You know, and when, I, when I've talked about this, uh, you know, in, in teaching grief stuff like this, I will ask, give me, give me the list. Give me the horrible things that somebody said to you. And, we'll, and uh, you know, I have my number one. It, we'll find out if yours is worse. If it's worse, then I'll go back and, and switch my number one. But right now, just give me the list. And people will throw out the, these mm -hmm. horrible, you know, yeah. you're hurting so much. And someone says, oh, it's part of God's plan. Or or a new angel is in heaven. Or, mm -hmm. it, it's like, oh, no. no, no, that's not. But we don't know what to say. Yeah. You know, you know, <laughs> the sympathy card comes around the office and you want it first because mm -hmm. everyone else is going to get the good thing to say and you can <laughs> copy what they said. Yeah. So you have the one standard in your head or someone says, let us know if there's anything we can do. Yeah. And then they're not there when you need something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and plus that puts it back on the grieving person to decide what it is they need at that moment. Cause maybe they don't know. I know I didn't know. Cause I got that a lot when my brother died. Let me, let me know if you need anything. I'm like, I don't know what I need right now. I'm freaking sad and I'm confused and I'm scared. And then, yeah. And then when you finally like a week later and I can't get out of bed and I could just, some, if somebody could bring me some soup, but I, it's hard to reach out then and ask for that. So that's why I encourage people instead of saying, let me know if you need anything. Offer specific help. Hey, I'm going to come by next week and mow your lawn. Yeah. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. kind of thing. That's perfect. That's yeah. Perfect. Or I'm going to take your kids out for ice cream so you can have a day to yourself to, you know, take care of whatever you need, know, grieve, do whatever you need to do. And, you know, I'll, I'll help manage that for a minute. But we line up with to say stupid things and bring banana bread, you know. <laughs> How many freaking loaves of banana bread do you have to have before you're supposed to be done grieving? Okay. I know. <laughs> the taste of banana bread and grief. There's something about yeah. it. You'll never want another casserole again either. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank Ooh. you. <laughs> so many casseroles. Do you want the dish back? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just put this away. Put this away. Um, so, 
I want to know that, and you don't have to spoil anything for your book, but what's the, what, I want to know the worst platitude you have heard. Worst thing, uh, I, I, I did a funeral for uh, an eight day old baby. Oh no. And uh, the, the father was a former student of mine. I had actually been visiting the year before and they got pregnant and eight days and it was, and it was one of those, you just have to say nothing about, there's nothing about this that doesn't suck. Mm -hmm. So right now, everything sucks. Mm -hmm. And I was, I told the mom to say, all right, there are, I have a list just doing funerals all of my life. Here's, here's, I have a list. I want you to keep track and not say fuck you to the person who comes up, but just to remember the worst thing so that I can put it on my list. It was like a yeah. homework assignment for her. And a few days after the funeral, she caught me and she said, okay, I have it. Oh, I said, no. you know, she said, I'm standing at the coffin, the, this casket that is literally this big that looked like a beer cooler for some reason. I don't know. It was this horrible little co tiny coffin, you know? And she said, somebody came up and held my hand and said, well, you can always have more kids. No. And I said, you didn't say she said, no, I smiled and said, thank you. And she went away. I said, well, <laughs> good for you. I mean, what, what strength you have. Yeah. Wow. Next to the coffin, someone said. Oh, that. my. Uh. Yeah. yeah, I, uh, I serve on the board of directors for a nonprofit that provides support for women who've had pregnancy or infant loss. Uh -huh. um, and we, I, I mean, people have told me all the things and I, I think all the time about um, the story when I was uh, at my church, uh, one of the congregants had a baby died of SIDS and this baby was like eight months old. So he'd been around for, a, you know, a, a while, eight months and died suddenly. And we had the funeral there and the pastor came in like at the very beginning stood up and said, before anybody says anything, I don't want to hear these words. I don't want to hear it was in God's plan. I don't want to hear there's another angel in heaven. I don't want to hear there's a baby in God's garden from any of you because that is in, he just kind of went on a little rant, which was beautiful because again, what a terrible thing to say to a grieving mother, Yeah, you so, know, because in so, my, my brain, if somebody, you know, said this was in God's plan, I'd be like, well, God's kind of a dick. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If he killed um, a baby on purpose, that seems like kind of a kind of a dick move. Yeah. Um, it was not this is not God's no. Yeah. I mean, yeah, all those things. Yeah. Silence sometimes it just Yeah. Silence, hold my hand, give me a hug and I'm yes. going to now. That's there's nothing you don't have to say anything. Yeah. Just hug somebody and be on your way. Let me, yeah, let them, you know, scream in front of you and curse and swear and <laughs> get yeah. it all out is a beautiful gift. Yeah. Um, I had another question and it just escaped my brain. So give me a moment to remember what the heck I was going to ask. All right. It's, it's been a day. Um, my okay. grandma used to say those things go to your ass. She said, <laughs> what? And and she said, you come in, you can't figure out what you were in for, then you sit down. Oh, I remember. I remember. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's well, that maybe I should stand up. No, I remember. It's fine. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you were to offer advice to somebody who is either newly grieving or supporting somebody who's newly grieving in your years of experience, uh, what what would you say to them? What would your what would be your best advice? Grieve at your own pace, number one. Don't let anybody tell you how to do it. Uh, it the the stages of grief uh, is not a to-do list. You're not going to check them off one by one. You're going to yep. do them in a different order. Or, you know, depression tends to be like a boomerang where it, it, you, once you think you're done with that, no, you're not done. It's going to come flying back at you mm -hmm. after, after a while. Mm -hmm. But... 
uh, when I talk about the stages of grief and when I'm, when I do a talk, I usually add one at the end. So you have, you have denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And I always try to add the word promise. And my, my, my promise is this isn't permanent. Mm -hmm. My promise to you is that eventually, eventually, when you get there, you're going to think about this person and you're going to laugh mm -hmm. instead of cry. I promise. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, th this past Christmas, uh, we were all together as a family and uh, we started talking about my mom and all of a sudden the stories started coming out and we were laughing and I realized we're, we're just, we're just laughing about this now. You know, I once, mm -hmm. I once painted my mother a Santa Claus ornament and I painted him with no pants. <laughs> okay. She, she collects Santa Claus, little ceramic ones that she had all around the house all year long. Oh God. I, and I painted her a little tiny Santa ornament and I painted him with no pants. And I thought it was hilarious at the time. She, she did not <laughs> okay but, but <laughs> the look that she gave me was what tipped us all off this past christmas was do you remember when you did that for grandma and she started and then, and all of a sudden we're all laughing again and it was like okay we've now hit the point where all of us mm -hmm. at the point where the promise is you will laugh instead of cry yeah. that's that's the promise and, and it seems to hold true. Yeah. And I always encourage people to, to, to laugh. It's, it's okay to have, it's humor is okay in death. And at any time, if you're at the funeral and something strikes you funny, whatever, man, go for okay. it. Like, I still remember when we took my brother's ashes to the cemetery after he was cremated. I, I think I've told this story on this podcast before, but my parents were driving and I was in the back seat and I had the urn in the back seat with me. And I kept screaming like, mom, Scott's on my side. <laughs> Cause you know, we used to do that. We we're kids growing up. <laughs> we fought endlessly. And I thought my mom was going to be mad. She turned around. She goes, we'll turn around and go home right now. <laughs> <laughs> I will turn. That's great. That's great. I, I just, ah, uh, just. Yeah. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, went to my father-in-law's funeral. My wife's father. Okay. Oh my! And, and because I have, I I'm was a professional youth pastor. I have a collection of these, which is a very small device that <laughs> that's that's all it you held quietly in the hand, and then <laughs> one of those. And I would I. I took it upon myself to be the one standing at the funeral. You know, I'm next to my sister-in-law and I've, I've got it down here and we're, we're standing literally calling hours when you all come in, look at, get to look at the body and she's next to me. And, it, huh? and she looked at me and I sort of waved it away and we turned back and, <laughs> <laughs> and she finally stopped. She said, what do you have? <laughs> And I and I held it up and she yanked it away from me and put it in her purse and said, No, you're not I'm not giving it back. <laughs> but she laughed and it was that okay, you once you once you tip the moment, yeah, it, it's, it's okay, you know. And plus my father in law would have thought it was hilarious anyway, you know. See so, okay if you bring one of those along. I've made my friends promise if they're still around when I die, I want my funeral to be a roast. I want <laughs> A cremation or <laughs> well there'll be a literal roast and then a roast <laughs> no i i had another friend who i told him he needs to hold up my urn with my ashes <laughs> nikki reached her goal weight <laughs> <laughs> he said he'd do it so okay. that happens <laughs> he promised he would do it <laughs> so no, I, I, I appreciate though, that some people are not ready for humor, especially mm -hmm. at the funeral. If it's mine, they better be. But, um, I also respect when people are not, not in a humorous mood. You have to, as a comedian and as an improvateur, I know, know your audience, you read the room, <laughs> read the room and, and know most of the time it's people 
I, oh, there was a funeral I did back when I was at the church where I was working. Uh, there was a guy named Ed. He had, he had died and he was, had retired. And all he talked about every Sunday morning was going golfing. Oh, I went golfing. You should come golfing with me. It was, golfing was his thing. And we got, it was the, the funeral and just outside of the of funeral, I was talking with my boss and I said, you know, Jesus and Ed went golfing one day, and I told this dumb joke about golfing, and I just inserted Ed into the into the story. And he laughed. He said, you have to tell that. I said, I'm not telling that. It's a funeral. He said, no, I'm going to point to you, and you tell up, stand up, and you tell the story of Ed and Jesus going golfing. It's like, okay. So it, it was very somber. Everyone's telling the stories of, I remember the time when we, and we sang you know, how great thou art, all those horrible, slow funeral hymns. <laughs> and then my boss stood up and said a few things, and he pointed, and I stood up at the pulpit and said, so Jesus and Ed went golfing, and there was silence. <laughs> oh, mean, no. And I'm in, and it's like, I can't stop this now. And I kept going with it, and you heard this <clears throat> from the congregation, it was his wife. And she was in the front row and she did this beautiful snort laugh. Yeah. And half the room was did not get the idea of telling the joke at the funeral. But she came up and so did his daughter just to say thank you. Good. Thank you so much. Ed would have loved to have that there, you know. Good. So but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Read the room and see what happens. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. Well, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a comedian through and through. So there better be comedy at my funeral. Uh, or, and if there is, I fully approve. If there's not, well, then I guess that's not what anybody wanted that day. And I accept yeah, I that too. I want everyone in my funeral to get a, a bulletin and a red rubber clown nose. Yes. So I get, I get that. I also told my wife, I'm with, I want to be buried in a pink taffeta formal gown. <laughs> So that when people come up at the at the beginning or at the, you know and they they can see me there, they'll get one last laugh, or they got to think of something nice to say to my wife who'll be standing there by the coffin, you know. Doesn't he look natural? <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But that's amazing. Oh gosh, thank you so much for the laugh. This was awesome. Mm -hmm. Um. So I have a little tradition on my podcast with mm -hmm. my guests. I will, I'm going to pull a card at random from the death deck. Okay. Uh, these are conversation starter questions. And um, I hope, I hope it's not a, a really serious. I had, I felt so bad. I had one on that was not, oh my God, are you kidding me? I swear to God, I pulled this at random. The question is, which of these phrases is the worst to say to somebody after they lost a loved one? I'm not kidding. <laughs> Um, a, I know just how you feel. B, they're in a better place. Or C, everything happens for a reason. That's crazy. I literally pulled that at random. Every the 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 worst thing is to say everything. I, I was just doing a, a a lesson on this this morning. Where every yes, everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that reason is you're a dumbass. You know, so go fix it. But everything happens. No, everything doesn't happen for a reason. <laughs> but everything that happens can be assigned meaning. Yes. Like I've told people, don't look for the reason. Look for what meaning you're going to assign to yeah. this. I love that. I also, I really can't stand the I know how you feel. Like, you don't. Don't <laughs> say that to somebody. Even if they've suffered a, a, a similar loss or... You know, they lost their mom and you just lost your mom. doesn't matter. Everybody's relationships are different. Everybody's griefs are different. So you don't know how they feel. So please don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> just don't say that. Um, all right. Well, Steve, this has been an honor. I would I'll give you a moment here. If you have any other amazing parting stories, words of wisdom, funny things, and uh, and also tell people where they can find you, your books, and all your creative works. Uh, you, I'm I'm all over Amazon. Uh, you can look up under Steve Case. There is another Steve Case in youth ministry who also writes. Oh so, dear. So I, I'll I'll give you the link to my page yes. of stuff. It will he, be in the show notes, everybody. He is much more conservative than I am, so you know oh. some of some of his books are big a difference. More, 
you know, he doesn't have any fart books out there. I got well, two, then two, that's two. no fun. <laughs> yeah, so I'm all over Amazon. Uh, if you're going to Wild Goose this year, I just got invited to Wild Goose Festival. So if that's in July. If, if you want to come and come and say hi, I'll be doing a, a death workshop there at Wild Goose. Uh, other than that, um, I'm I'm just currently working on a book about organ donation for explaining organ donation to children. I and that, that works and it's it the text is done and we've got a tremendous illustrator who's gonna come on board so hopefully that'll be out later this year so Yay. well gonna- when it comes out i will let my listeners know and tell them where to find it because that and i have a another death doula friend here in columbus who works for the lifeline of ohio so he talks to families all the time about organ donation. So I will be sure to put that book under his nose as well. You like a triple screen where like you, me and the artist and you can, we can all do it together. That- I love it. I love it. That would be amazing. All right, Steve, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure as always. It's always a pleasure. I love talking to you. You have my sense of humor. We get along so well. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. See you. Once again, a huge thank you to Steve for being on my show. We had such a blast. I, off off, uh, the recording, I had asked him to send me some information after we spoke with like his bio and, you know, links to his book and everything, which I had that, but he just sent me an email like not even two minutes later and said how much fun he had. So thank you, Steve. I had a blast too. I always do. So again, I will put links to his stuff in the description. He also has an Instagram, which is utterly hilarious. You should please check that out too. I'll put the link to that in the description. But it's eyes underscore up underscore with underscore Milo, M-I-L-O. It's really funny. Go check out his, his Instagram. So yeah, like I said, links to all that will be in the description. You can find me at NikkiTheDeathDoula.com. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, all at NikkiTheDeathDoula. So before I sign off, I know I had my special announcement. So hopefully you heard that. If not, this is going to be my last episode of this season. So you will hear from me again in about four weeks, and then I'll get into season two. All right. Thank you everybody so much for tuning in. I love each and every one of you and I'm so happy you're here. And remember, as always, your grief is yours. Your feelings are valid. Grief doesn't always have to suck. 